Okay, welcome to the Tom Nelson podcast. I have Henrik Svensmark here. And Henrik, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, yeah, I'm a, I'm a physicist uh, at the, the Danish uh, National Space Institute. Um, and uh, well, as a physicist, I've been working on uh, trying to understand uh, how uh, solar activity is uh, affecting uh, the climate. And it's um, it's been something that we've been doing uh, for now uh, more than 20 years, uh, trying to understand this uh, I mean, there's no doubt that uh, there is a connection between solar activity and climate. Uh, so th this is, uh, it, it's been a challenge uh, trying to understand <laughs> this uh, relation. And uh, the major connection is to low clouds through cosmic rays? Well, I mean, uh, that, that's been the idea. Initially, yeah. uh, we just had that uh, there was apparently some connection between solar activity and uh, temperatures uh, on Earth. Uh, and the the question is why there should be such a connection. And it took, uh, uh, well, I mean, that was more or less how I got into it because I just speculated that uh, it could be that uh, if it's going to work, solar activity should somehow affect uh, the Earth's cloudiness uh, because the idea that uh, solar irradiance should uh, be important, that would be the most simple way that you could affect the climate. Uh, with solar activity, that these changes are simply too small to uh, have a, a large effect or to have an effect on uh, on climate. So something must amplify solar activity. And the idea is that the Earth's cloudiness uh, would be a, a very effective uh, way of uh, amplifying solar activity. So that that was the sort of the general idea. And that idea I got in 1995. So you can see it's. Uh, it's uh, many years ago. I wrote it down here. It says, by ionizing the air, the cosmic rays help to form the aerosols. That's the basic idea of what you're talking about? Yeah, because if you are affecting clouds, then you have to figure out, uh, you know, uh, how are clouds actually formed? Mm -hmm. uh, and in order to form a cloud, you have to have uh, what we call aerosols in the atmosphere. These are, uh, you know, m molecules uh, clumped together which are floating in the air. They're so small, you can't see them uh, with the naked eye, but they have to be there uh, in order for water vapor to condense and becoming a cloud droplet. Because the supersaturation uh, is only about one or two uh, per percent uh, or, yeah, or even less uh, in the, uh, the atmosphere. Uh, and uh, so in order to get water vapor to condense and becoming a, uh, a cloud droplet, you have to have a surface on which uh, the water vapor can condense. And this is provided by these aerosols. And when the aerosols are big enough, that's when we call them cloud condensation nuclei. Okay. And then uh, you have tested this in a chamber, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, initially uh, we didn't know uh, exactly what we were looking for, but the slowly we realized that it had to be aerosols that were the uh, key to understand some of these things. Okay. And uh, with that, uh, we were able to formulate the uh, theory and uh, we could do it so much that it's our, in such detail mm -hmm. that uh, we, we could actually start performing experiments. And it took quite a while to get the experiments uh, going, but uh, uh, the idea is uh, to make a large, uh, I mean, we have a large chamber uh, and in the chamber, we put air that is very similar to what you have over the Pacific. Uh, so it's very clean uh, air. And then we try to mimic uh, the processes that are going on in the uh, real atmosphere. So uh, we have uh, UV light, which uh, can produce uh, what we call photochemistry. That means that if we have some gases uh, inside this chamber, uh, in very, very small uh, concentrations, then uh, we can have chemical reactions, uh, which has to do with photochemistry. That means that the UV light goes in and changes things. Uh, and uh, what is happening is actually we are producing sulfuric acid uh, in very, very small concentrations. And sulfuric acid, this molecule, which is produced naturally uh, in the atmosphere, uh, is extremely good at uh, making molecules stick together. And when they stick okay. together, that's how we produce the aerosols. 
so in this chamber, we also had uh, radioactive sources uh, outside the chamber, so we could radiate uh, the chamber. So by increasing the ionization in the chamber, we could then see uh, what, what, what is happening to the aerosols. And uh, in 2007, we published the first uh, and most important result, which showed that when, as we increase the ionization, we, we actually produce more of these small aerosols. And, and of course, the idea is that if you produce small aerosols in the real atmosphere, uh, then it would also translate into uh, producing more clouds uh, or more cloud droplets. And that will change the uh, cloud properties, uh, the microphysics uh, of clouds. So uh, initially, we thought that uh, we were home safe uh, with this experiment, that uh, we are producing more of these small uh, particles uh, or aerosols. And then they have to grow to cloud condensation nuclei and uh, then we would have a link between ionization and uh, clouds. But it, it turns out it was not that simple. Uh, okay. There was more to the story. Okay. Uh, what, what was the, uh, the, uh, the hang up there? The... Uh, we did this work in 2007 I, okay. and I thought that uh, we, we were uh, okay. And uh, in 2011, the cloud project, uh, which was in uh, Geneva, uh, which is part of uh, this uh, CERN uh, project, uh, where they have the big accelerators, they also did some experiments there, and they got more or less the same result that this, we produce a lot of these small aerosols. But the, the problem is that the small aerosols have to grow to become cloud condensation nuclei, and they, they have to actually to grow uh, almost uh, you know a million uh, in mass. So it's, it's quite a lot, and it takes uh, on the order of one week uh, to grow to uh, cloud condensation nuclei. So what a lot of groups uh, or a number of groups were doing, they took these ideas and put them into large climate models. Uh, where they tried to mimic uh, the processes uh, that they thought was going on with respect to cloud, uh, with respect to uh, aerosol uh, physics. Um, and what they found was that uh, even though they put in more of these small aerosols, they wouldn't grow to cloud condensation nuclei. Uh, most of them got lost. I mean, the, the, the thing is that you, if you have a small aerosol, it might get lost on a on a large aerosol on a cloud droplet, uh, and therefore it will not uh, help uh, in any cloud uh, formation. So what they saw in these models was that, that the the aerosols did not grow to cloud con condensation nuclei, and that was uh, uh, I think the first result came out around two thousand and nine, and then a uh, a number of results have been coming out uh, ever since and last I, I think it's about 2016 all saying that uh, that this mechanism is uh, you know it, it was a good idea but it doesn't work um, but the problem is uh, when I heard about these results I thought that was, there must be something wrong with the uh, physics uh, with the m physics that you put into these models. One reason is that we did some experiments where uh, we, I mean, first of all, we did some experiments where we tested the idea, um, with, where we tested the idea of growth. Uh, so if we didn't have uh, ionization on our chamber, then we experienced that the, the particles did not really grow up and become cloud condensation nuclei. Um, they got lost uh, in the chamber. However, if you put ionization on the chamber, uh, we could see that uh, more or less all of them could grow to cloud condensation nuclei. So that indicated that maybe there's more to the story uh, than uh, what has uh, been known. Uh, and the second thing is that uh, sometimes uh, this, there are some large explosions on the sun. And these large explosions, uh, they throw out a lot of plasma uh, and uh, this plasma is sort of uh, contains the sun's magnetic field and it shields against the cosmic rays. So if this plasma hits the earth uh, on some, some, some of these events uh, that makes the uh, cosmic rays uh, a drop by maybe 30 percent uh, within a, a number of hours and then over a week uh, it sort of uh, uh, comes back to the uh, background level uh, again. 
so so these events you can see them as a natural experiment with the whole earth and uh, you can then test i mean what is uh, is something happening to the uh, clouds is something happening to the aerosols and when we look for, on the strongest events uh, we can see that uh, there's a, a drop in the aerosols as we expect there's a, a drop in the cloud uh, uh, in the number of clouds following these uh, events and um, we can also see that the uh, the energy budget of the Earth is changing so that uh, actually on the order of three watts per square meter is uh, coming into the uh, uh, surface. Uh, at, at, at an additional three watts is coming into the uh, surface of the Earth. So we can see sort of the whole chain from solar activity to cosmic rays to aerosols to clouds to the radio uh, budget. So it suggests that something is going on um, and that this mechanism is actually operating in the uh, real atmosphere. In 2017, uh, we, I mean, we published a paper and it was uh, based on uh, more than four years uh, of intensive work where we finally discovered that ions are also helping uh, the growth uh, velocity of uh, aerosols. So uh, the ions are not just producing new small aerosols, they are also accelerating the growth velocity of these small aerosols. And that uh, means that there's less time for them to be lost on larger aerosols. So uh, this is something that helps the survival of uh, of the aerosols. And this mechanism has not been included in any of uh, the uh, uh, models that tested uh, our idea. So it looks as if uh, nature has decided that this mechanism is actually operating in the uh, in the atmosphere. Okay, interesting. I think in one of your recent papers, you said you hadn't seen one of those events. I don't know if you called it a four bush event. Yeah, yeah they're you, called four bush events. Yes. Yeah, yeah, but you, th we hadn't seen one for over a decade. I think I don't know if there's any update. Have we seen one at all in recent years? Or? Yeah, there, there hasn't been any uh, for a, a, a long period. I think the last, I mean, strong. The last strong event was in two thousand and five. So it's uh, been uh, almost 15 years and it, it sort of goes in hand with the uh, period that we are in where we had very low solar activity. Um, but there has been very strong, there actually has been a very strong uh, forbush decreases, but they didn't hit the earth. Uh, so in 2012, there was one of the strongest, but it simply passed, uh, it went in a different direction than the earth, which was good because it was very, very, very strong. I mean, there is a probability that uh, it can really, uh, um, it can, uh, you know, harm uh, satellites. Um, so, so um, we are uh, vulnerable uh, to to these uh, events with our high technology. Um, so it, it can be a problem. And then I saw in one of your papers that you said there was a surprising consistency between variations in the cosmic ray flux and variations in climate seen on time scales on nearly all time scales uh, from days to millions of years, right? I think that's pretty interesting. Yes. The, the thing is that uh, when, I mean, there are different time scales that we can see these uh, effects. And uh, we just talked about uh, solar activity and solar activity is changing uh, the cosmic rays uh, I mean, it's much because of the uh, the the sun's magnetic field, uh, which is changing with the solar activity. Then uh, uh, solar activity can modulate uh, the number of cosmic rays. And over the last ten thousand years, uh, in the Holocene period, we see uh, you know beautiful correlations between solar activity and uh, and uh, changes uh, in uh, climate. So it makes it uh, near certain that there is a connection between the two. Now, when we talk about cosmic rays, uh, cosmic rays are actually produced when, uh, are mainly produced by uh, when large stars uh, explode. Uh, in the aftermatch of a large star explosion, this is what we call a supernova. Um, it, uh, because of the explosion, it makes a shock front that is moving out in the interstellar uh, media. 
and this shock front, it's, it can actually accelerate particles, uh, mainly protons, to enormous energy. And cosmic rays are, consist of mainly protons with uh, this very, very high energy. Um, so on very long, so so you can say that the supernovas are really the source of cosmic rays. Um, and if we look at a very different time scales, then our solar system is moving around our uh, galaxy, uh, and it's moving around the galactic center, and uh, there's something we can call it a galactic year. That is the time it takes to circle. Uh, one time around the galactic center, and it takes about 240 million years, so it's an extremely long time. Um, and in that travel, uh, we get in and out of regions where we have more or less star formation, and where you have a lot of star formation is also where you produce the big stars that become supernova. Uh, so in our travel around the, the galactic uh, center, we get in and out of regions where there are more or less cosmic rays. And the interesting thing is that when you see um, uh, the changes in climate uh, over the last 500 million years, uh, then we have periods where we where the Earth is, uh, you know, in a, I mean, we are in a gla glacial period. We have periods where it's very warm and an Israeli physicist, uh, uh, Professor Nir Shaviv, yes. he uh, actually noticed that this fit very beautifully with uh, the solar system passing through spiral uh, arms. So when we are in a spiral arm, there's more cosmic rays because we have more star formation in these regions. We have more cosmic rays uh, and it's actually colder uh, on Earth. So. Uh, there is a beautiful correlation between the this this movement uh, around uh, the galactic center. It's also interesting from another perspective because it's a completely independent way of checking whether this mechanism is working. Um, uh, because solar activity has nothing to do with the uh, supernovas; it's just a modulation of the cosmic rays that are uh, present on a time scale of uh, thousands of years uh, down to days. Uh, whereas uh, on uh, with respect to the supernovas, we are talking about the changes over millions of years, which has nothing to do with solar activity. Mm -hmm. So we see this beautiful uh, correlation uh, uh, over these uh, long uh, time scales, uh, which is which is completely fascinating, uh, I think. Yeah, so I've seen Nir Shaviv uh, present that. Uh, he gave a presentation at a Heartland conference a while back. I thought that was very compelling stuff. But what's the argument against that? Do people on the other side say uh, it doesn't matter when the Earth is going through those spiral arms? Uh, that doesn't really affect climate, nothing to do with the Earth's climate? Because uh, Nir's uh, argument is that's a very big effect on the climate, right? I mean, I'm it curious very, what the uh, argument yeah, yes, is. Yes, it has a very big effect yeah. on, uh, on the climate. It's interesting that uh, there is a uh, group of uh, geologists uh, who also believe that uh, the reason that climate is changing on geological timescales is because of CO2. So there's this idea that it's the CO2 that is uh, changing uh, 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 climate, uh, even on these uh, long timescales, although there are some discrepancies. and. The thing is that, I mean, there's not really a good argument against uh, the, these beautiful correlations. I don't think that there are any other uh, quantities uh, that have such beautiful correlations as we see uh, over these uh, last 500 million years. And um, it's not just um, it's not just uh, climate. Uh, it's also other uh, parameters uh, which are uh, uh, Correlating beautifully uh, with uh, 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 this uh, supernova history that we've had over not just the last 500 mil uh, million years, but even over the whole history uh, of the Earth. Okay. Uh, what do you mean? What What other things other than climate? Uh, well, I mean, this is some of the work that I've uh, been mm -hmm. doing, which has to do with uh, the conditions or the, you can say, the, the conditions for life on Earth. Okay. Because the climate changes that we are talking about are uh, 
between a cold and a, and a warm period uh, over the last 500 million years, the temperature changes are in the order of 10 degrees uh, with the uh, mean temperature of the Earth. Uh, and that is quite a lot. Uh, and that will have influence on uh, on the uh, conditions for life. And if we look at, um, I mean, I, I, I just published a, a paper with uh, where I look at uh, how much organic material that has been buried in uh, sediments. This is something that uh, a, a, a geologist can uh, obtain uh, through most of the history of, of the earth. Uh, and they, I mean, simply when you have, um, when you have life uh, on, on earth, life with, I mean, all, all the life we have is carbon based. Mm -hmm. And when you have life, uh, if you have plants, or uh, um, you would rather you would rather uptake a light form of carbon, which is carbon twelve. One percent of the carbon is in the form of carbon thirteen. So that means if you have a large biosphere in the ocean, meaning that you you have a large bio biomass, uh, then you have a larger uptake of carbon thirteen. Uh, oh, sorry, of carbon-12 uh, into uh, into the life. That means that in the rest of the ocean, there's more carbon-13. So when you have inorganic sediments, um, then you can measure how much carbon-13 you have relative to carbon-12. And if you look at that, you can say uh, something about how big a biomass you had on Earth uh, back in time. Uh, in essence, it has to do with how much uh, how much organic material that has been buried in sediments. Uh, so you can actually measure uh, that. Uh, and if you look at this variation and you compare it uh, with changes in supernovas, there, there is a, a, an astonishing um, uh, correlation between the two. So, uh, and this is something you can see in, in quite high detail over the last 500 million years that the variations uh, in the, in the, in the, this organic material uh, follows uh, the supernova history. But also, if you look over the last three and a half billion years, you can see this beautiful uh, correlation between the two. Um, so the question is, why is there such a uh, correlation? And it it is because when you have a colder climate, you have a uh, uh, you have a larger temperature difference between the equator and the polar regions, and that gives you much more uh, dynamic atmosphere and dynamic uh, uh, oceans. So you have a much better mixing of nutrients, uh, which are important for life. So by having a colder climate. Uh, you are delivering more nutrients to the uh, biological systems. And nutrients is a limiting factor and has always been a limiting factor for uh, uh, life uh, on, on, uh, on Earth. Uh, so climate is regulating uh, the amount of uh, nutrients that goes into the uh, biosphere. That, that That is the interpretation. That does interest me because... Uh... How about when it was warm enough to have crocodiles and palm trees up in the Arctic? Uh, was total uh, photosynthesis, for example, then uh, less than when it was really cold out? When the Earth? Well, I, I yeah. think that the delivery of uh, nutrients was lower. Uh, it doesn't mean that there wasn't. Um, um, uh, I mean, it was certainly warmer, and you could have, uh, you know other species higher up uh, at higher uh, latitudes, but you can see that the uh, amount of uh, organic material buried in uh, sediments is, is smaller uh, during these periods. There's right. another there's another really interesting thing about this uh, because uh, photosynthesis is, uh, is how we produce oxygen. Uh, and uh, if when you produce oxygen, uh, it means that uh, you take some uh, carbon dioxide and some water, and you, because of life, you can combine it to uh, uh, glucose and uh, uh, oxygen. But if you then take the carbon and just leave it on the surface of the earth, then it will be broken down again. So the CO2, uh, the oxygen will then recombine with the uh, carbon, and you then get CO2 and water uh, 
again, that means that you will not netto produce any uh, oxygen. The only way you can produce oxygen is that after you produced, uh, um, I mean, after you 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 combine the CO two uh, and the water, you you have to bury uh, the organic material. Uh, if you bury that in sediments, then the oxygen is free in the atmosphere. That means that uh, this uh, fraction of organic material that have been buried, uh, how that is changing as a function of time is also the source function of oxygen in the atmosphere. So now you have the idea that, uh, or you have the, the implication that the changes in supernovas has actually also been the changing, uh, has been regulating how much oxygen is uh, free in the, uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, as a function uh, of time. Um, okay, uh, I, I want to read a quote from you before we get uh, away from supernovas. I thought it's from the conclusion of one of your papers. Here's your quote. A biodiversity and bioproductivity, D13C, all appear so highly sensitive to supernova in our galactic neighborhood that the biosphere seems to contain a reflection of the sky. I think that's end quote. That's really good stuff, I think. Yeah, Yeah. That, uh, I mean, that is the, the thing that... Uh, these processes which are happening, uh, you know, completely outside our solar system in our galaxy are affecting uh, um, uh, affecting life and has been important for how life could uh, develop uh, over time. And as we just talked about, oxygen is, of course, a fundamental for any uh, complex life uh, because that is how we uh, transport energy around in uh, in complex uh, organisms. Uh, so, so oxygen is is really really uh, important for the evolution uh, of uh, of yeah. uh, life. And again, I want to make sure I understand this: that you've seen these beautiful correlations at lots of different time scales. Uh, you can see those real life uh, correlations, but the argument is against you is that no, those correlations don't exist, and that CO two is the climate control knob. Is, is that well? Um, yeah. Uh, now I I just uh, got one paper uh, accepted, uh, which of course went to peer review, and the the. Uh, the uh, reviewers were, of course, they, they were very happy about the uh, the paper. So it's not everybody that is uh, against yes. uh, what I'm doing. There was actually, and it even made the front page of uh, uh, geophysical research letters. So okay. in that sense, I felt that uh, it the the uh, um, idea uh, that we are promoting, uh, you know. Got a little, little, little better reception uh, than uh, than normal, but it's also I think it's extremely uh, interesting and uh, strong uh, results that's that uh, that we are uh, presenting. So I think it's difficult to say that it's not. Uh, I mean, it, it it's obvious that it's wrong. I, I don't think you can say that say that uh, at the moment, and several. People in geology has uh, I have talked to say that the, they they have the problem that they don't think that they can explain their data with the changes in CO two on these uh, geological timescales, so therefore they think that this uh, idea could uh, be uh, you know of interest. Uh, uh, I mean, they need something else than uh, just uh, explaining things with CO two. Uh, yeah, I mean, with CO two, you don't have the beautiful correlation at all, do you? No. No, you don't have yeah. uh, these uh, beautiful uh, co correlations that we are talking uh, uh, about. Not at okay. all. And also, uh, the thing is that uh, if climate is following CO2, sorry, if climate is following um, uh, cosmic rays and supernovas, uh, and CO2 is also following, uh, I mean, if, if it were following, then yeah. uh, the CO two could not uh, change the supernovas. Uh, I mean, so so you yeah. would have a, a causation uh, problem as such uh, if the C if if the cosmic ray idea uh, is uh, correct. So maybe uh, some of the changes in CO two is actually from uh, life and biology uh, on the Earth. Uh, the biosphere is changing. Uh, and that is changing, I mean, uh, how much CO2 is taken up uh, into the uh, biosphere. 
so that is why there are these changes, and these changes might actually be because of changes in supernovas. So it's, now you have a cause of, of uh, an effect which uh, originates from uh, from the supernovas. Okay. Is it correct, though, that any change in supernovas that affects us on Earth, it has to come through cosmic rays? Is there any other possible mechanism other than cosmic rays and oh, if, to connect if, us to supernovas? Or? Uh, I mean, you could imagine that you had a very, very close supernova okay. uh, where you got some extra radiation directly from uh, the explosion. Uh, the probability of, of a very, very close supernova is uh, very uh, low. And uh, it would be devastating if it went off, you know, within uh, less than 10 parsec or something like that uh, of, uh, of the Earth. Um, I think 2.8 million years ago, there are evidence uh, from the sea bottom uh, ocean uh, course where you can see a supernova went off 2.8 million years ago. Um, it was not that that close, but it was close enough that uh, a lot of iron 60, that is an isotope of iron, uh, it rained in over the earth. And you can then in this uh, in this uh, ocean core, as you drill up, you can see that 2.8 million years ago, there is a large spike uh, in this uh, iron uh, 60. So this is an indication that a, a, a supernova quite close to the Earth went off about 2.8 million years ago. It was published in 2004, as far as I remember. And in that paper, they also said that uh, this 2.8 million years is coincides with a large climate change in Africa, where the uh, climate ch changed in such a way that the uh, jungle changed into savanna. And it's believed that uh, this climate change had a big effect on uh, human evolution uh, also. Um, so I, that 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 uh, this climate change has a big uh, effect on, uh, on human evolution uh, is completely independent of uh, the idea that it could be a supernova that, that caused uh, this uh, climate change. But anyhow, there is a coincidence there, even there, yeah. So. Okay. So a single supernova might also be uh, might also affect uh, things, but in general, it is a collective effect of many supernovas that we see here on Earth. Okay, and then is it true that uh, the sun or solar activity could affect the Earth's climate uh, in other ways other than deflecting cosmic rays, or not? Do you think the sun can have any effect on volcanic activity? Um, or the other one I wanted to mention before I forget, how about the uh, change in distance to the sun? Uh, it slightly yeah, uh, changes yeah, yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you talk about the change in the distance to the sun, we are talking about the astronomical theory of uh, Milankovitch. Uh, okay. Yeah, I guess that's what you are uh, considering. There's no doubt that Milankovitch is also uh, is something that is uh, affecting climate. That's typically on the uh, 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 twenty to uh, hundred thousand years uh, timescales that you have these uh, changes, which has to do with the with the orbital orbital. And precision and so on of uh, of the uh, the Earth. Okay, um, so you wouldn't expect climate changes on shorter time scales based on distance from the sun. That that's more just on longer time scales. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, uh, yes, I think so. Uh, I mean, uh, the distance uh, to the sun is not changing uh, on on uh, on very short time scales. Of course, we are changing over over the year. Yeah. But uh, that's a, uh, that's another thing. But then there are some very slow changes uh, where okay. the summer and winter is also uh, changing and so on. But there are, of course, other ideas about how the solar activity can change uh, climate. Uh, so in all of these years I've been working, there, there's been other groups working on different ideas, ideas like it's a total solar irradiance. So. Okay. So the total solar ir irradiance is uh, the, the total energy output of, of the sun, if that is changing uh, as a function of time. We know uh, when we measure with satellites that the changes over the 11 year cycle is, uh, is just less than one per mil. Uh, so uh, these changes are so small that uh, they cannot really affect uh, climate. But then there are some people who think that uh, on longer time scales, Maybe if we go a thousand years back, there has been ch larger changes in uh, in solar uh, irradiance. 
Then there are, of course, also ideas that uh, the spectrum of uh, the solar output is important, like the uh, UV uh, changes uh, could be important. So there have been some idea uh, because the changes in UV can be on the order, uh, if you go to the higher frequencies, uh, maybe uh, 5 to 10% uh, changes over a solar cycle. I mean, so the idea of the cosmic rays and clouds is not the only game in town, you can say that. Do you have any opinion on, uh, does the sun have any effect on volcanic activity on Earth in any ah, way? No, I don't. I, I never okay. studied it. I, I heard people talk about it and uh, there are some, uh, I heard some people trying to make some correlations, but I, I have to, I, I cannot say anything uh, intelligent about it. Until, okay. So. What other points would you like to make? Let's see. I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, so what we are talking about is mainly the science, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, one of the big problems for me is uh, is uh, uh, getting uh, these idea uh, mm -hmm. accepted. Yes. Um, so, so that's that, that's been a uh, a real uh, problem because uh, I mean, when we talk about global warming, um, it is extremely political um, uh, or politicized uh, science and. The things that I'm working on, even though they are quite interesting, is uh, then uh, they, they are seen as a, as a problem for the CO2 yeah. theory. Because if uh, solar activity has a larger effect, it would mean that uh, uh, CO2 or the climate sensitivity to CO2 ha has to be somewhat smaller. That means that you would have a less of a problem, perhaps. And uh, that is not something... Uh, that is taken very uh, light, I, I would say. Um, so that gives me uh, uh, that gives this these ideas uh, big problems. Uh, mm -hmm. um, how far off do you think the IPCC is uh, when they are estimating the solar influence on Earth's climate? I, they're not just off by ten percent or something, right? They're off by a order of magnitude or something, or what do you think? Well, I mean, they, they don't. Uh, they, they, uh, in the IPCC report. They say that since 1750 until now, the solar effect is so small that it has had no uh, effect whatsoever. And the reason that they're saying that is because they are only considering solar irradiance. And there are some uh, uh, results indicating that the changes in solar irradiance uh, are so small that they cannot affect the climate. But what we are talking about is, of course, an effect on clouds uh, and aerosols. So that would be a completely different uh, uh, e effect. And there are some estimates. I know Nia Shaviv has, uh, together with uh, uh, one of his students, Siskin, uh, looked at the effect of solar activity over the last uh, tw over the twentieth century, and they find that uh, I think. Uh, uh, about 50 percent if i remember correctly about 50 percent of the warming we've, we've had over the 20th century could be from uh, solar activity so and if that's true it means that the uh, uh, climate sensitivity to co2 is uh, smaller i mean you have to remember that uh, when we talk about climate sensitivity i mean when from models you get that if you double co2 you get between two to four degrees uh, most of the temperature increase is not from CO2. It's because you imagine that there's uh, uh, less clouds uh, in the in a future climate. Uh, the direct effect, effect of, um, from CO2 is actually only about uh, 1.3 degrees for doubling a CO2. Uh, and uh, 1.3 degrees, uh, there, there's a lot of uh, studies now that indicate that the uh, the climate sensitivity is close to 1.3 degrees, uh, which is uh, uh, what we call the black body, uh, where there's no uh, climate feedbacks uh, in, in, involved. So that would be really good news uh, because then we will have less of a problem uh, in the uh, in the future. But um, it's 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 going to be very difficult to accept such a result. Okay. Uh, what have you seen in terms of uh, reception to your work over the last 20 years or so? Are you, are people even more resistant now or are you getting more support now or what have you seen as a change? No, it's, 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 it's actually good. I mean, in the beginning, uh, there was more discussions and I was invited to have, uh, 
you know, discussions where you were discussing whether uh, there was natural effects on climate and you had discussions with uh, people who were believing it was uh, CO2. So you had this kind of uh, discussion with an audience. Uh, now it's completely shut down any really? discussion whatsoever. So there's no, uh, no interest. Uh, it is... Uh, as if uh, they have decided that, I mean, it's been decided that uh, the things that I'm working on and solar activity, uh, that has been answered. And the answer is that it has no influence whatsoever. Um, so it's become, um, there's no interest. Uh, I mean, there's no invitations for anything. It's, it is impossible for me to get uh, funding uh, for doing this kind of work. Um, it's um, uh, it's a, I mean you can say it has been a really bad career move uh, <laughs> to to have to to work on these things. Uh, unfortunately, uh, do you have any predictions at all as to what might happen in the next thirty years to the climate or to climate science in terms of people uh, if Earth continues to not uh, warm? Uh, another 30 years uh, at some point the truth has got to come out doesn't it what do you think yeah I, there's no doubt that uh, if if climate uh, is not warming uh, as much as you expect uh, then uh, it would be a problem uh, for uh, the ideas i mean i don't think science is the most i mean the scientific results are not the most important things uh, i think it's the kind of policy that you want to imp impose uh, on all of this so it's not a matter of being very rational and getting, uh, you know, presenting the uh, right results because uh, uh, it's more of a political uh, uh, struggle uh, to make some changes uh, in society. I think uh, um, it it it's uh, <laughs> I I think uh, it's only if uh, if money runs out of uh, climate science. Uh, for doing CO2 science, uh, then things will move over to something else. Uh, but I, I mean, it's not happening soon, I think. Okay. Do you have any advice on what climate skeptics can do to try to help the truth come out? Any? What, what can we do? Well, I, I think it's important yeah. to uh, to do the, the research and to get, uh, you know, real results out because at some point they, they will serve as a... Uh, uh, a sort of a, a witness of uh, what's right and wrong. Um, so, so doing a, a research uh, is extremely important. I, I know that there are, there are people who are very uh, also active, like politically, to trying to change uh, things. But uh, for me, as a scientist, this is not really what I want to do. So I don't want to do any. Uh, uh, political uh, activation. I want to do uh, good science. And uh, I think the reason I, I continue to do this science is because the results are so exciting and uh, it has such large consequences that uh, any, 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 anyone who hear about these things thinks that it, it's really interesting. And uh, uh, as long as they are not uh, doing CO2 science, uh, they think it's a, a normal climate uh, uh, scientists, they think it's really interesting, um, and it. I, I think a revolution will come at some point, uh, but it. it I, I don't know when. Okay. Do you get a sense that the the people that are doing the CO two science, uh, do you think they're fully bought into it and they really believe it, or is there some sense that uh, they got to go where the money is and they don't necessarily well, I, believe? I, it? I, I'm pretty sure that uh, there are a lot of uh honest uh, people doing uh, climate science uh, no no doubt about it but there's a lot of self censorship meaning that uh, you have so many examples of people who have uh, said uh, things uh, which has upset pe other people uh, in the climate community and it had really bad con consequences for them so therefore y you are trying to avoid uh, controversial uh, statements or, or statements that could be seen as controversial so i think i think this uh, self censorship is uh, is a, is a big problem uh, i mean but it's it's quite natural i guess because people don't want to have a trouble uh, and you most certainly can get trouble if you uh, say the wrong things
Yeah. But you have not personally self-censored yourself, right? You just say whatever the truth is uh, as you see it or do you feel uh, I, I mean, I, I started to work on these uh, things with respect to and the long time scales because I thought that uh, people would not uh, be upset about that. But it turns out to be wrong <laughs> because uh, they also want the CO2 to be a part of that. No, I, I try to be as on. I mean, I try to be as honest as possible, but I, I'm I'm not. Uh, I mean, when I give talks, I not necessarily talk about uh, CO two and climate models and their problems and so on. Because it's, I mean, it's only if people ask me, I I, I start uh, and then I ask, uh, then I answer, yeah. of course, honest. Okay. Do you get uh, support from scientists on the back channels where they tell you uh, privately that they think that you might have something, but they will not publicly say that you might be right? Do you see that at all or no? Uh, well, I mean, yes. Uh, uh. I even uh, heard uh, about a story uh, about a big uh, climate institution uh, where the director said uh, that uh, he thought that cosmic rays and clouds were really interesting, but uh, they couldn't uh, do any research in it because it would send the wrong uh, uh, political signals. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, interest uh, in it and uh, people think it is, I, I, I think people think it's interesting, uh, but we are, I mean, there's not that many people working on it. And for good reasons, because uh, it's very, very difficult to uh, get your research funded and you might risk being uh, marked uh, in such a way that you will get difficulty in getting any research funding in the future. I'm just curious, what is your estimate as to how many scientists are focused on the solar influence on climate, that that's what they're working on uh, all year? Is, is it I, don't think there are, I don't think there are very many. I, I think it's... Uh, less than 30. Amazing. Okay. So there's this idea that Exxon is uh, funding, they've got billions of dollars in funding, and you can get so much funding if you uh, don't agree with CO2 science. That's complete baloney, isn't it? That, that's complete baloney. I, I mean, I, I, I never gotten any money from any uh, uh, oil companies, I, anyone. I, I know that uh, several of the... Uh, <laughs> other groups uh, that are doing the CO2 and modeling, they, they get money from both Exxon and the BP and so on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. But if I got money from them, it would be, uh, you know, the, the people would be screaming. Just remember what Willy really soon went through. We, I think he got from some uh, energy company at some point. Right. Uh, if you had... Uh... If you, you had a billion dollars, or let's just say uh, 10 million in funding to study natural influence on, on climate, uh, do you have an idea already what you would spend that money on? Or... Yes, I, 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 I sent in uh, applications to get uh, 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 these uh, things. I mean, we, I, I have a, um, I mean, one of the things that we're doing here is that I, I build up a large uh, laboratory uh, here where we have very unique uh, experimental uh, equipment. And we want to do uh, some experiments where we want to look at the, um, for instance, we want to look at uh, why there are correlations uh, between supernovas and uh, 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 life and climate uh, on the very long time scales, even before there was oxygen in the atmosphere. Uh, so trying, we can then do experiments where we don't have oxygen in our chamber and then see if we can produce aerosols uh, the same way. Um, uh, and that would explain some of, some of these uh, correlations that we are seeing. So uh, this mechanism that we are talking about that might actually be working uh, under very different conditions because it's not a chemical uh, mechanism. It's it's really a electrostatic uh, interactions uh, that are happening between the charges and so on. So we have a whole uh, laboratory with unique experiments. Uh, and for the last, uh, since, since 2017, we have not had funding to do uh, experiments. Yikes. So, so it's just uh, all uh, still, and I'm trying to get funding so we can get uh, uh, an extra person uh, to work uh, on the uh, experiments and to work with me. 
Okay. Just an order of magnitude. Do you have some idea of a dream uh, setup that you'd like to use to test your theories? Uh, how much would that cost? Uh, it's hard to say, I'm I, sure. I, I think uh, what should be done, uh, and it is something that we are trying to do now, that is to do the exact same thing as the climate modelers have been doing, which is to take a large climate model. But in our case, we want to put in the right physics uh, for the aerosols and then see that we can actually produce uh, a cloud condensation nuclei, uh, just like uh, they see that that uh, that the mechanism is not working, but they don't have the right physics uh, in these models. I mean, I think it's something that should have been done a long time ago, but nobody wants to do it uh, because uh, I think uh, the result is, uh, I mean, it's, it would be devastating uh, in the sense that it would show that this mechanism is operating uh, in the in the real atmosphere. So I think that would be a really good idea. Okay. And if you had the funding uh, right now, would you be ready to uh, start working uh, pretty soon on it? I mean, if you had I, the funding, could, you could start. Yeah. I, I could start now. <laughs> I could start tomorrow. So I, I have an application in, uh, and I've had a number of applications in, but they are all rejected. Uh, so, so, I mean, if someone has some ideas, they should uh, tell me, that would be uh, fantastic. We have some of the most exciting uh, physics. Uh, uh, I mean, the consequences are just astonishing uh, if this is true. Okay. Well, maybe somebody out there does have some ideas. We'll see. I mean, I had Martin, I had Martin Durkin on here, and he was saying he would like to remake the Great Global Warming Swindle, but it looks like he might end up getting some funding for that. So oh, really? I would love it if. Well, yeah, it looks like. So I I I, I met him uh, and a few years ago, and he said he wanted to, to make a global warming swindle too at that time also. So oh, okay. So he's okay. not giving up. All right. Well, maybe somebody out there can help you out. I hope so. I mean, it seems like uh, it has to happen. I would love to see you get more funding and go for it. So uh, right now, how big is your chamber? You mentioned there was an eight uh, square, eight cubic meter chamber. Is that yeah, something I mean, that you yeah. have now? Yeah. We have this eight uh, cubic meter uh, chamber uh, and uh, we have all these uh, instruments. We have a a, a nice uh, mass spectrometer uh, where we can measure individual molecules uh, and all the chemical reactions that are happening inside the the, the chamber. We have all kinds of uh, instruments that can measure all the gases that are inside the chamber, CO2, ozone, ammonia, and so on. Uh, and uh, we, we, we have a, a gas system that we uh, also have installed uh, where we can produce uh, oxygen-free uh, atmospheres uh, so we can really test all kinds of things uh, in this uh, chamber. Yeah, this is super and, interesting. And then, of course, and then, of course, we have uh, radioactive uh, sources that we can open and close so we can change the ionization inside the chamber. So this is something that we have been uh, been uh, doing uh, for a number of years. And uh, this, the last really important paper was in 2017. It actually came out in Nature, so in Nature Communications. So so it, it was a, a really uh, uh, also an indication that the results were quite solid. Okay. But since then, your funding has pretty much dried up, huh? It has pretty much uh, dried up. Uh, it has been, uh, yeah, it's been dried up. Do you have other points you'd like to make before we go ahead and wrap up here? No, I think uh, we got around uh, both uh, the science and some politics uh, related to it. Uh, and even my my hardship uh, with uh, getting the research done. So that's no. fine. No, this has been a real eye-opener eye for me. So thank you very much for taking the time. And I, I hope to uh, ta have you on at some other time if you have some time. Yeah, yeah okay. and uh, if people are interested, they can contact me. So thank you very much for doing this. And uh, we'll talk to you next time. Okay. Good. Thank you.